in you because what's up ahead of the road for the church in the future, there, there's going to be some challenges for elders. Already are. There's going to be some more. And so it's going to be imperative that we have godly men that are trained and willing to be courageous and stand for the truth. And so don't ever take that for granted because you have it here and you have had it for a long time, but it's possible that we don't get it at some point and it'll be a detriment to the church. Don't ever lose sight of that. Exodus chapter 35. The questions look something like this. God didn't want them working on the Sabbath, did He? What was the punishment for working on the Sabbath? That'll stop it, won't it? Because if you do it once, you'll be done, won't you? You won't work but once on the Sabbath, will you? Because if you get caught, you'll be dead, right? And so you won't make that mistake twice. He meant what He said, and He said what He meant, didn't He? The punishment for working on the Sabbath was death. A lot of people came in Exodus 35 to help with all of, all of this building and preparation for the tabernacle. Men and women all came, and they had one thing in common. What kind of hearts did they have? Willing hearts. Do you realize that there's one thing? There's one thing that God has always wanted. That is a willing spirit. He's always wanted. He don't want you to do nothing because you've got to do it. He don't want you to do anything out of obligation. He don't want you to do anything out of compulsion. It's always willing. He wants you to be willing. Everything that you do comes from a willing heart. It's not by accident that Moses says in Exodus 35 that everyone who came had a willing heart. That was important. That mattered. They showed up because they wanted to. They engaged in the service because they wanted to. It was a willing heart. Part of that service in Exodus 35 was spinning the yarn for the curtains in various parts of the tabernacle. And there were women who done that. Don't get politically correct on me here and don't get into a gender battle here. I'm just telling you there were women who done it, okay? There were women who spun the yarn to make the curtains. And the Bible says in Exodus 35 that all these women had hearts, not willing hearts, well, they had that too, but hearts that were stirred with what? Wisdom. Hearts that were stirred with wisdom. That's how it describes the women who sit and spun the yarn in order to make the curtains and various things for the tabernacle there. So we're nearing the end of Exodus, almost to chapter 40. Wade said we were five weeks out. That's pretty close, Wade. There's about five chapters left, so we ought to be pretty close there, right? Well, Luke chapter 10. We're in Luke chapter 10 on the story or parable, whatever you prefer, of the Samaritan man. We'll talk to you a little bit about attitude tonight. Attitude's important, right? Every time I say the word attitude, I think about that old camp story of mine that I've told you many times. Every morning, attitude check, right? And you're supposed to holler out, I feel good. Oh, I feel so good. And, and you know, it's amazing what just saying that, even though some days it's the biggest, fattest lie you could ever tell. But sometimes, sometimes, psychologically, it kind of works a little bit, right? Even if you are having a bad day, and even if you did stay up too late last night, and even if you did lose an hour of sleep, and even if you don't feel good, sometimes just the whole idea of shouting, I feel good, oh, I feel so good. I got one goal tonight, and it's going to make me feel good, and that's to get you out before dark. I'm going to accomplish it tonight. You just watch this. You just watch I'm watching the sunset. You watch me, and we'll get out before dark, all right? I feel good. I, I'm telling you, days like today make me feel good. I just love that. I need some days like today. It, it makes you feel good. Some days aren't as good though, right? Attitude's a big deal. Attitude affects how we interact, how we react, how we respond, how we treat others. 
Attitude's a big deal. You know, you would think as a preacher that one of the worst things you could have is elders mad at you. That's not correct. One of the worst things that you can have as a preacher is women mad at you. So I'll go ahead and make all the married women mad right now, okay? We'll just get this out of the way. Y'all need to be listening very well, married women. Are you listening? Because there is a lot of application in this story to married women, okay? You've got basically four categories here, all right? You've got five people, four categories. Category number one is the lawyer, right? What's his attitude? He's trying to trap Jesus. I've never known a married woman didn't want to trap her husband. And he's trying to justify himself. I've never known a married woman that wasn't right, okay? I'm just making you mad right out of the gate. I'll explain more later, okay? The second category, married women, you're going to fit here too, okay? If you didn't fit there, you're going to fit here. Married women. Category number two is the robbers. The robbers think what the man traveling down the road has is theirs. I've never known a married woman who didn't think what her husband had was hers, right? I mean, what's his is mine, right? That's how married women think. All right, category number three, the priest and the Levite. We'll put them together, okay? I realize they're two different people. We'll put them together. What's the priest and the Levite's attitude? Well, their attitude is what's mine is mine. I've never known a married woman that didn't think what was hers was hers, right? So what her husband's has is hers. What she has is hers. So there you go. You got three categories. Married men, you only got one. Sorry. It's the Samaritan. And the Samaritan felt like what he had belonged to the man who fell on the road. Right? Married men, if you don't feel like your wife owns it all, you need to stop. Okay? So there's where you'll fit, right? All right. So now that every married woman in the room is mad at me, Let's proceed with something a little more applicable. Go back to the lawyer in all seriousness and think about this for a moment. Think about his attitude of... The Bible says in Luke 10 and verse 25 that he sought to test Jesus. He, he, wanted, to, he wanted to trick Jesus. He wanted to, to... Really what he wanted now, really what he wanted was he wanted eternal life, didn't he? I mean, that's what he asked. How do I inherit eternal life? Now, I realize I'm not there. I don't know for sure. I realize that this is psychology, and I know nothing about psychology. But think about the question for me just a moment. Could it be possible that in all seriousness, his real attitude is, what's the easiest way for me to get to heaven? He wants to test Jesus. He's trying to trap Jesus. And his question is, how do I inherit eternal life? Could it be the case that what he's really asking is, hey, you know what? I want to go to heaven, and I want to take the easiest route possible. In our modern day of technology, I love it. I love it. I don't know how to work half of it, but I love it. I can type in where I'm going on my GPS, and if somebody's had a wreck up there, my GPS will tell me that the wreck's happened, and I need to go here to go around it and save some time. One of the greatest inventions since sliced bread. Love it. I, I can't stand traffic. I can't stand sitting in traffic. And I don't have any patience, okay? So wrecks are terrible for me. I mean, road blockages, it might not be a wreck. It might be construction, Construction up ahead, one lane is, you know, closed, and so go this way, and re man, that's the greatest thing ever. I want the easiest route. I want the, the route of least resistance. I want the quickest route. Well, that's how I live life. And if I'm not careful, that's how I act spiritually. What do I have to do? What, what can I do and, and, and accomplish it enough to, so then I can take that off my list and, and go do what I want to do. I, I want to go to heaven. Don't misunderstand me. You do too. We want to inherit eternal life. But Jesus, tell me what the, the, the easiest route is so that I can confirm, that I, I can check off my, my, my routes and my turns, and I know I'm there, and, and I can go on and do what I want to do. 
I don't know if that's possibly what he might be getting after here. It seems to me a plausible explanation to his attitude. And if you and I are not careful, we can fall into the same trap, right? Going to heaven's not easy. Going to heaven takes the right attitude and the right work ethic and the right desires to be righteous and holy and, and to do what it is that God wants us to do. And it's not always easy. And it's not always the path of least resistance. And it's, it's not always the most pleasurable route. And it's, it's not always what I want to do. And so it may be that we have to adjust some attitudes along the way. I have to have some attitude checks and make sure that, that we're not like to... Let me, let me just test Jesus and see. Now, now, if I do just this much, will that get me there? And so therefore, my ticket's punched and I don't have to worry about that anymore. I don't know that that's necessarily what he's saying, but it's possible. The other thing that happens with the lawyer, drop down to verse... 29. We mentioned all of this this morning. Nothing new tonight. Just thinking about it a little bit deeper. We went into some of it this morning. Look what happens in verse 29. He looks at Jesus and wishing to justify himself, he asks, who is my neighbor? Seeking to justify himself. Do you know people that think, you know, I ain't as good as I could be, but I ain't near as bad as him or her? Ooh. That's a pretty good attitude, isn't it? It's really not. It's a possible attitude, though, isn't it? It's even possible in this building tonight, isn't it? Could the lawyer be saying, you know what, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you. I haven't, I probably haven't done all I could do, but I'm a good person. I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as him or him or her or her. And so verse 29, is, his attitude is, he's wanting to, to justify what he's done. As if to say, well, okay, maybe I could do better, but I'm, I'm, already, I'm already good enough. Watch this. I'll, I'll get Jesus to confirm it. And so he asked that question, who is my neighbor? The attitude of the lawyer's pretty bad. We move then into the, to the robber, to the robbers. In Luke 10 and verse 30. And the Bible says this, A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers. Plural. And notice what they did. They stripped him. They beat him. And they departed and left him half dead. All of his valuables, all of his clothing of value, all of his jewelry of any type. He's been to Jerusalem. He's traveling back to Jericho. He probably had some, some money for the trip. He, he, he probably had some, some luggage along with him there. I don't know how long he, he'd been in Jerusalem. He probably had some, some valuable clothing with him. By chance, he had an animal. He could have been riding on an animal. They took his animal. They took, him, they took everything he had. I don't know what all he had, but they took it all. But then that wasn't, that wasn't good enough. They, they beat him. They, they kicked him. They punched him. They slapped him. They, they spit on him. They... They bruised him. They wounded him. They beat him up. And then they left him. No, no value for human life of any sort. No, 
no care, no concern. Basically, they just said, we're going to take what you have regardless. That was their attitude. Their attitude was, I want what you've got, and I'm going to take it. Now maybe it wouldn't be as graphic as that in the Lord's church. But just like we talked about this morning, when we begin to look at the end as the ultimate goal and the results, then what it takes to get us to the end can be justified. When all our concern is, is so, so here's what happens. You've got something I want, and so I began to, I began to covet. Well, coveting is wrong in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Covetousness is condemned. It's part of the works of the flesh. It's part of the sinful desires of mankind. Perhaps because of maybe what it leads to. Things like greed and lying and Maybe even stealing. Oh no, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go take something from the store and not pay for it. But maybe you would rob and steal in other ways. Maybe you would lie and cheat in other ways. The attitude says, I want it. I got to have it. And I'll do anything to get it. It's the attitude of the robbers. And if we're not careful, that can be the attitude. What's yours is mine. And it's not. And I can't justify any means to get it. We come to the priest and the Levi. Luke 10, verse 31. Now by chance, a priest came down this road. Just per chance, he's coming from Jerusalem. I mentioned this morning he'd been in Jerusalem, more than likely serving in some priestly role. He'd gone up to Jerusalem to perform his priestly task, if you will, as a Religious man as a as a obedient Jew. And as he's coming back down the road to Jericho, he gets the opportunity to practice his religion. And the Bible says in Luke 10 and verse 31, when he saw him. He went to the other side and passed by. And I realize that the Levite in verse 32 is a different man, but same category. Let me put them here together in terms of attitude because essentially they do the same thing, right? Another godly man, another religious man who comes down the road, sees the man laying there, has the opportunity to practice religion. We just call them the passerbys, is what we call them. Here's what that attitude looks like. Too busy to, too busy to get involved right now. Got, got too much else going on. Too busy to, to get involved. If, if I get involved right there, that, that may cost me something. So I'm not going to get involved because I don't want to have to, I won't have to pay and realize that it may not be money, although it did include some of that here. But it may, it's going to cost me. To get involved, it's going to cost me. So I'm just too busy to get involved. 
and I'm, I'm not concerned enough to give up something. So I just pass by on the other side. What's that attitude look like today? Well, let me tell you what it looks like for me, and I don't know what it looks like for you. But I told you I was going to get pretty real with you on Sunday night, and this is about as real as I know how to get. My family and I, we went to Kroger two weeks ago on Wednesday night after church. We closed Kroger down. You know why we do that? Or why we did that? I can't go to Kroger with my family. I love you people and I love everybody in Lawrence County. And it seems like when I go to Kroger, they all show up. And I'd be lying to you if I didn't look down an aisle and see somebody I know and keep walking. Ain't that terrible? That's what it looks like. And if you've never done it, praise be to God. But I dare say I ain't the only person in this room that's done it. What it looks like is when the phone rings and you know who it is. Caller ID is a wonderful blessing, ain't it? Too busy to get involved right now. They may actually need me. There are times when you can't answer the phone. There are times when I need to go to Kroger with my family and I need to be with my family, okay? Listen, we've all got that, all right? I understand it. There are times you can't talk on the phone. There are times you couldn't embark in a, in a conversation right that minute. And, and, and fair enough, we've all been there. But, but when it's over and over and over, what you need to ask yourself is, Am I becoming the priest and the Levite and just passing by on the, on the other side? I hope not. But if we're not careful, that attitude can plague us. When people really need us, I've asked you before, do you know that I've asked you, I've, I've not asked you rather, but I've told you now, if you need my help, you let me know. You know the worst thing you can do right there? Tell me something you need. I'm, I'm really just telling you to get it off of my conscience. You understand? And don't tell me you're guilty of that. Now, you've never done that. You really mean it when you say, if you need me, call me. And then when they call you, you think, oh no, what in the world? You ask for it. That's what the too busy passerby. I, I, didn't, I didn't really want you to call me and tell me something you needed. I just, I just needed to say, hey, I'm here for you. You know, because I, I, that... If we're not careful, listen to me, really. I, and I, and I, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm not stepping on anybody's toes but my own. If we're not careful, Christianity becomes something we perform and not something we practice. God ain't looking for performers. This, this ain't a casting session, you understand? God's looking for people that are going to practice it. Say what you mean and mean what you say. And then follow through. Don't be like the priest and the Levite. They went down to Jerusalem and they looked like these big religious gurus. And they get headed down the road and they've got an opportunity and they don't take it. Don't, don't be that person. Don't be any of those first three categories. Come to Luke 10 and verse 33 in your Bible there, and the Bible says, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, he came to the, where the man was, and he, like the priest and the Levite, he sees him. 
And then the Bible says in Luke 10 and verse 33, He had compassion. Now what does that attitude look like? What does that attitude do? Literally what it says is that the inside of this man went out to the man who was laying half dead on the road. He didn't just walk by and go, ugh, that looks rough. No, as he walked by and saw this man, his heart came out and was touched for the man. He didn't even know who he was. He's a stranger. He, he don't care. Here is, here is human life, and I don't care what ethnic background it is. I don't care what pay scale it is. I don't care what tax bracket he's in. Here he is, half dead. I got to do something. And his attitude was, you, you read verses 30 through, 34 and 35. His attitude was, what's mine is yours. You need it? You got it. You need more? I'll give it. So he bandages his wounds up. And he pours on ointment for that. And he puts him on his animal that he'd been riding. And he walks beside that animal. And he leads him down to the town there. And he puts him up in the inn. And the man stays there. I mentioned this this morning. The man stays there all night with him. Nursing him. Caring for him. Bandaging those wounds again. And everything I've read and studied this week suggests that verse 35 would say to us that this was probably a businessman. This Samaritan was probably a businessman. So the next morning comes and he's, he's got to go on and make his appointments, so to speak. He's, he's got clients or whatever waiting on him. And so as he leaves that morning, he leaves to Denarii, and he tells the innkeeper, you let him stay here as long as he needs to stay here. And, and, and it appears that the Samaritan was probably a frequent visitor to this hotel because he's planning on coming back by. Thus, the conclusion that perhaps he was a traveling business salesman of sorts. And he says, when I come back by, obviously the innkeeper trusted him, didn't he? Because he, he let him he let him have a, a line of credit, so to speak. I'll give you two here, and, and, and if the two won't cover it, verse 35, when I come back, you just keep up the tab, and I'll pay the tab when I get back, when I come back through. Talk about going above and beyond. Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse 41, if any man compels you to go with him one mile, you go... That second mile religion right there, Luke 10 and verse 35. There it is. That's what it looks like. That's the attitude that drives it. It says, whatever I have, you can have. If you need it, it's yours. No reservations, no hesitation, no questions asked. When I say, I'm here for you, when I say, if you need me, call me, that's what I mean. And that means whatever, whenever, however, I'll be there. I'll do whatever I can do. Anything I have that I can use to help the situation, I'll use it. Second mile religion. He stayed with him the night. He interrupted his whole schedule for a whole night and then proceeded the next morning. I guess I would assume feeling like the man was okay enough to recover and paid his tab. 
What's our attitude like? What motivates us? That's ultimately the attitude, isn't it? What's your, what's your motivating factor? I, I'm, not, I'm not asking for your feelings because sometimes you don't feel good. I, I understand that. I, some days I don't feel good. But what is your attitude? That's different from your feelings. Your attitude is what propels you to do whatever you do. If it's a selfish attitude, it propels you to fulfill selfish desires. If it's a greedy attitude, it propels you to, to, to make more money or to get more money somehow. If it's a humble attitude, it propels you to treat others better than yourself. If it's a sacrificial attitude, it allows you to give up everything you have for the betterment of those around you. What is the attitude? What is it that motivates you? That drives you? Maybe you like the lawyer. Maybe you like the robbers. Maybe you like the priest or the Levite. I hope not. I hope you like the Samaritan. I hope that's your attitude. A church of Samaritans truly will have a great impact on the community and the world around them. A group of Samaritans truly will encourage and build up and strengthen one another. I don't know about you, but I want to be in a group of Samaritans. And it wouldn't be fair for me to want to be in that group and not be one myself. I'm asking you to have the attitude of the Samaritan. God's asking you to have the attitude of the Samaritan. If not, would you come right now as we stand and sing?